Hello everyone, welcome back to the Collider Studio at San Diego Comic-Con 2023. I am beyond thrilled to be with some of the team behind the Continental because your show is exceptionally well done. I couldn't believe when I got, I mean, mere minutes, we're gonna touch on a specific scene that comes up at the beginning of episode or part one. Once I got to a specific staircase fight scene, that's like the thing that kind of took my breath away and solidified that I was in for something that was above and beyond my original expectations for the series. So congratulations to you all. Thank you. I mean Thank it. You. I mean it. Marshall, I'm going to start with you here. As the EP on the show, I am very curious about finding the right two direct. We're going to make Marshall talk about you right now. I'm sorry. But the right two directors to lead this project because the film franchise is so heavily defined by Chad's style. So what was it like finding two leaders in that respect that would continue that style but also make it uniquely their own as well? Well, that is a great question, but it's it would be for Thunder Road and Lionsgate because I came on because Albert asked me to come on. And Which is a great answer, yes. Marshall, because I needed help. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what happened was they, they approached me. It was Basil Iwanek and Erica Lee, the producers of the film series, um, that did a Zoom with me. And at first I didn't think I would be interested. And then I started thinking about things like Tony Gilroy and Andor and John Favreau and Mandalorian and Noah Hawley and Fargo. And I go, oh, you can kind of make, make something in, that, in a sandbox that already exists and that it, it took place in the 70s. So I go, this can be fun. And then when I got on the ground, got introduced to all these guys, but I had to bring Marshall in because I needed desperate help because it, it, it's, it's a very complex show, as you can see, especially when you're dealing with a, a, a period, it's kind of a period piece, you know. So I'm going to flip that idea yeah. around now so you could sing Marshall's praises. You said you brought her in because you needed her. Yeah. What is it about her as a, as a producer and collaborator that you appreciated and thought would serve your work well here? Good question, because I'll <laughs> say that about her. We called her the glue. Me and the sh showrunner, Kirk Ward, who was my partner in crime, she had her tentacles in every department. Um, there are certain scenes that I look at. I remember telling her last year, I go, you produced every element in that scene. And you know the one scene I'm talking about, there's a monkey in it, there's a horse in it, there's aerialists in it. It's like every element of that scene, she uh, diligently and like went to town working hard on, right? So that's her specialty, is uh, nonstop going hard, right? Then you have Larnell, our stunt coordinator, our action unit director, um, who comes from the 8711 world with Chad and David, and know that world and know those guys very well and know their style, right? I'm gonna introduce them all and then tell them what I think oh, the specialty is, okay? <laughs> and then, uh, and then you, you let them talk. And then um, the genius uh, Ron Rosen, who I've worked with before, is not one of the best editors I've ever worked with. He is the best editor I've ever worked with, and he's a real genre movie freak, and he loves John Wick, so that's great. Then Drew Bowden, okay, my production designer, who just did amazing things that blew us all away. Like, there's things you've seen in episode three that show up at the end, right, um, that the crew just were like, just shut down and we're in silence about for 15 minutes. So I got very lucky to have all these people because they say it takes a village, but sometimes the village is like messed up and don't work out. I got lucky. So, so many follow-ups to this. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start back and, and get into specifics for each of you. So you get brought in to be the glue and have your hands in every element of this production. Is there a single thing in the script that you're like, I'm gonna have my work cut out for me here. Like it's gonna be hard to pull this off, but we'll do it. Well, I, I, I will now talk about Albert, who the, the, whole, <laughs> the whole reason that you want to work with Albert is that he loves to challenge himself and he loves to, and then therefore that challenges everybody who works on it. So basically everything has to be done in the way that the movies were done in the 70s. And that, that was the great filmmaking and he is a wonderful filmmaker. He's been doing it since he was 12 years old. So it just makes it, even though it's hard every day, it makes it <laughs> fun. <laughs> And challenging. And what would be the hardest one? What do you think? The helicopter? Uh, that monkey, Marshall. The a, monkey. There should be a documentary on getting the monkey <laughs> in the opening sequence where Frankie goes to introduce himself to Cormac. Okay. I would watch that documentary happily. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to talk about the monkey. Go ahead, Larnell. <laughs> Albert and Larnell, I'm gonna throw this question to you to get at some specifics here. And I feel bad asking this because it's kind of 
asking you to play favorites with your characters, but going into filming this show, which character were you most excited to capture? But then on the other hand, which character wound up being more creatively fulfilling to work with than you ever could have imagined? Does it include stunts or non-stunts? Both. I want both. I want both perspectives. <laughs> well, that's actually a really original question, and I don't even have an answer for it. I'd say I, I was surprised by what he did with certain people that we thought maybe wouldn't get there, and then by the second episode, there was a really amazing fight in an El Camino by this the wonderful actress Jess Elaine, right? Um, because she was a little tentative, and she heard a stunt man one day, and. You know, she was really emotional about it, and they were telling her, like, no, no, this happens all the time, you know. So I was a little worried, but by the time we got to the El Camino, I'm like, whoa. And then we have to give them the challenge of something that Kirk Ward and I always wanted, the showrunner, when everybody says this thing, an analogy. It was like watching a fight in a phone booth. Larnell, we need a fight in a phone booth. There you go. <laughs> ding, ding. All right. Um, favorites. Um, I'm going to say, expectation-wise, a lot of pressure was placed on Frankie, expectation-wise. He starts us off. He makes sure you tune in, get you excited, give you a taste of what's to come. Surprisingly, I'm going to say the twins probably were my favorites because... Mine too. Okay, now you, you help me. <laughs> there we you go. help me. Yeah. The twins were my favorites because... As much as they were silent, their actions and every little thing Albert captured spoke loudly. So that added pressure to make sure that there was some payoff when it was time for them to be physical with anybody. And uh, they went above and beyond with these small things that will, stay, will stand out. I'm going to throw another compound question your way right now because th there are just so many hugely ambitious fight scenes in this. Going into filming, which did you think would be most challenging? And then ultimately, was it the most challenging or did something else catch you by surprise? Before you start, you know what was shocking to me? You thought one was the, the, what do you call it, like the crown jewel. And it ended up being another one that people thought was the crown jewel, what was interesting to me. But I'm not going to say which is which. You know what I'm talking about, though, right? Yeah. Yes, yes. Night, night three. Yeah, yeah, because there was a challenge of, of out-topping yourself and not overstaying your welcome in two different sequences. But the characters, their fights were so different, it was hard to compare. But you have no choice but to compare because they happen back to back. But the way we filmed it, there was the pressure because I feel like in any fight sequence, your finale fight can determine how people feel overall on what they've witnessed throughout the whole series because you're going to have these feel-good feelings about what you just saw was there the payoff and was it worth my time and uh i think where that fight ended up the last fight i, I don't want to spoil anything but I, I think we we accomplished our mission because that was a huge relief off our shoulders once we saw certain people get down and uh yeah you're talking about the two females yes yes okay yes well what's interesting about that is like me and him would always have a conversation about the thing he said overstaying your welcome right then he did the first edit of, of, of the fight sequence, uh, Ron Rosen, right? I maybe touched two frames on that. It hasn't changed since his edit, right? Mm -hmm. Drew, I gotta give him credit for being in a meeting one day and fighting for the rooftop build. Yes. Because every movie or TV show has budgetary problems and then we gotta cut this, we gotta cut that. Mm -hmm. Whether you have 200 million or five million, there's always cuts. And he just put his hand up one day, he's like, we have to do the rooftop, we have to do the rooftop. Yeah. And I was so happy he did it because by that time, Kirk Ward and I, the showrunner, were beat down. And we kind of were throwing the towel in. So had he not built that rooftop? But that's know. also because everyone trusts him so much because he would always deliver on budget everything. And so if Drew said, I need this, you were going to get it for him. Oh, I have so many follow-up questions. <laughs> Ron, I'm coming your way first because I want to talk about a very specific fight scene that we see at the beginning of night one. It's, it's the one -er in the stairwell. I'm so curious to hear about something like that from your perspective. When you read a script and know a fight scene is captured in a one -er like that, what are some of your top priorities as an editor that you know you need to convey to the team on set to make sure you could pull that off? Oh, uh, so much of this has been worked out before I've ever been involved with the project. And I came to this project as, like everyone else, just a fan of the John Wick movies, saw them all in the theater the first time, watched them again at home repeatedly. Um, but that staircase, um, yes, there was stunt viz, and they had worked it out with, and on video with stunt performers beforehand. But um, seeing the dailies come in that day and seeing the skills of uh, um, the actor who plays Frankie, um, it, it blew me away. I was, I was so impressed and so excited to get my hands material of that like that, but 
you know who wasn't happy? Um, my, I was cutting at home. My dogs would love to sleep on the couch next to me. They got wind of what I was doing with that scene. They fled that room and they never came back for a year and a half. <laughs> I feel like that's a sign of a really successful fight edit, though. Yeah, and he also hurt my feelings early on in the edit. I go, what's your favorite scene in episode one? He was like, the staircase fight. I go, that's Larno, I ain't even me. <laughs> it's incredible. From the, from the mind of Albert Hughes. It's, everything. It's, it's, it probably is one of the most memorable fight scenes I've ever seen. I, I'm obsessed with oners. I just love that format and how it can enhance an action set piece. But like, like in in particular, and like your actors' level of skills in that, it just feels so visceral. Where you feel every single punch land as well. It's oh, wow. very impressive. Very well, just to plug, I'm collider. That's, that's a great compliment. I mean, it's a great compliment, and that's the dreamy Ben Robson, who so good. is now can be a stunt person as well as an actor, which was his goal. Hmm from working on the show and working that with Larnell. I could see that. I want to stick with that scene for, for one more question for you, Ron, because the other thing I'm curious about when you're editing a one -er is figuring out when to break the one -er format and make perceptible cuts. How did you pinpoint the right spot to do that in? Well, there are a lot of invisible cuts in, in that sequence that, um, so it, it looks more of a, like a one -er than it really is, in fact. And they did have to shoot it piecemeal just for um, safety's sake and performers can only do so much before it gets dangerous. They can't ad lib all that. So it was so well designed and that came from these two guys right here. But also it's a very deceptive one. -er. The beginning of that sequence starts out as a, like let's say the, the sequence is 100%, 60% of it's a one -er. Okay, Then it starts breaking off into more traditional kind of uh, uh, little sequence one -ers basically, right? The, the funny part about that sequence is in the kind of struggle we would always have creatively, a good struggle was, oh, Larnell, and this is what 8711 does and what Chad and David do, it's like, they don't ever under-design anything. It's always over-designed with so many ingredients you can start to pull away some if you want. What most people don't know is there's a whole staircase sequence we cut out. There's another level, like a video game, we took one level out because I told Larnell, I thought, I go, you guys are doing all these wonderful things this thing that we cut out is so good, it undercuts all these other things. Mm -hmm. um, and I forgot what it even was, but you, you, you I remember, said it's too I didn't much talk of a good to you thing. For three days. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the team look: um, Mikey, Roger, Hank, uh, Ro, Jay. Uh, everybody had their hands in it, and you know the great thing about it is, like what Marshall, what I remember is, normally most producers don't allow the stunt team to go to the locations until it's finished, until it's time to shoot. But to help us prepare, they let us actually stunt viz the sequence at the location. So any room for error was eliminated. And I'll let you know another little secret. We filmed that sequence in one day. And yeah, not in, in under 10 hours. Yeah. yeah, because we were so well prepared, so well rehearsed. The teamwork was on point. Um, yeah, and I had to ask for maybe two minutes of overtime yeah. to that get my bad. final shot in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, As though I wasn't already impressed enough. <laughs> all right, Drew, I'm coming, I'm coming your way. I feel like we could sit here all day talking about every single set in this series. I am not allowed to keep you here all day. So to highlight at least two things, what wound up being the most ambitious build of the bunch, but then can you also isolate like some really small detail that might not be front and center in a frame, but you put a lot of work into, and it just winds up fleshing out the world in ways that people might not realize. Sure. Uh, um, the uh, the biggest build was the exterior of the Continental, which was uh, a huge set. It's about 40 feet tall, and like two football fields, NFL football fields, side by side in its footprint of construction, not like grass or you know just actual build. And so that was an enormous, uh, uh, enormous structure. But what was wonderful about it is that we had an obstacle wrapped, you know, we had an obstacle with an opportunity in it. And that was that the building in New York that had been used refused to let us use the facade as it had been in the, in the films. Even to emulate it. Even to emulate it. So we had this uh, opportunity, which is you got to change it. You got to change it for legal, legal purposes. So, you know, because the John Wick world is, is so much about art in all its different ways, about painting and sculpture and dance and photography. But in this, in this moment, it's like, how do I put the sculptures, you know, the kinds of things on this building? So we came up with the idea to put these eagles to give a whole new sort of menacing creative texture, like a secret society kind of vibe to the front of this building. 
So it was just terrific. And then we, we put uh, eagles in the back because, you know, once we started carving eagles, couldn't stop. <laughs> Makes all the and sense in the world. Because you asked about the little details. I know oh. it's not my uh, question to answer, but the tchotchke game, Drew's tchotchke game, <laughs> unmatched. Like, uh, if you look at Cormac's office, just look for the horses. Little details horses like everywhere. that is what yeah. keeps me coming yeah. back for more and more and rewatches and finding things along the way. I have to let you guys go soon. I want to ask uh, two more questions, though. Larnell, in one of your answers, you rattled off a whole bunch of names, and it was making me think of this because you are here right now, but there's a huge team of people that worked on this show. So can you each name someone that is part of your team or someone that you worked with directly that you know, you would call an unsung hero, someone who made all the difference in your own work, God where it helped you, you exceed your own expectations for yourself. Well, you're 100% on great questions. That's true. Jesus Christ. My heart. You go first, Marshall. I appreciate well, that. For me, I will say somebody from production because they're going to answer for the crew. So Sam Mill, who was our production supervisor, coordinator, just unflappable and helped get everybody in the country, out of the country, Deal During with. During a war next door. Yeah. Yeah. It's the kind of quality you need in but someone yeah, like that. Person. Sam Mill is a girl. I mean, I'm not going to stop you from naming okay. more people. <laughs> uh, my, mine is easy. My partner in crime, Kirk Ward, the showrunner and writer, who is tireless, tireless, and who was uh, embedded with Larnell and saw all that stuff in person because we, it was almost like working with my brother. I come from a partnership. One can split up and go over here. I stay in main unit. He has to deal with this craziness in second unit, so Kirk Ward's my, my hero. And I also want to say, in, in the midst of what's going on in the industry, I think this is wonderful that we got to do this because these are actually the unsung heroes. Um, and they don't get enough credit um, during panels like this. It's always the actors and directors that get all the glory, but these are also my, my heroes. I got to give it up. Look, Roger, Mikey, Hank, <laughs> Roar, all amazing, but Mikey, I, I got to give Mikey um, a lot of props on this. He was one of the fight coordinators. Very creative uh, with storytelling, action design. So we had our own language where we didn't have to say much and get a lot done faster. But he delivered that shot in the stairwell. That was him on the camera dropping down into the stairwell. And then that was him at the beginning coming out, getting thrown, and his, head got, four times. Yeah, his head got slammed three times. Then had to go upstairs, put a, uh, a harness on, and then get lowered with a specific timing where it felt like the camera became a character for just that moment where it didn't feel like a gimmick. But you're and not he, describing Mikey and really what he's a jack of all trades. He actually will shoot, he will do the stunt, yes. okay, he'll help uh, coordinate, and then he'll go and start editing it while they're moving on to the next shot, and he'll edit the sequence before yeah. they're done with the sequence. To make sure we had it. That, because we were on such a tight time frame, uh, there was one real difficult shot when I only had three minutes left. He grabbed the camera and got the shot on first take. That I had Mikey. three minutes left. And I didn't want to cancel this spot because it was a stitch between the next sequence. I was like, I have to get this, I have to get this. Mikey, get in there. You sell him so well, I can't wait to like go home now and Google every single uh, And I hope I know what your answer is. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, uh, <laughs> Ron? Well, first of all, I second Kirk Ward. He was our writer showrunner and he was supporting us every step of the way and was right there. But from also from my team, uh, Armin Gasparian was uh, started as my assistant on the first episode and by the end he had moved up to a second editor and he was so instrumental in, in not only the edit but sound and music and, and the glue and post production. So and he's Armenian. He's one of he's half of one of he's, yeah. I'm half Armenian. One of my brothers. Uh, so I'm gonna say uh, Zuzi Kismarty Lechner who's the supervising art director, and her amazing Hungarian team. Really extraordinary. So we would be, we'd be nothing. Yeah. Yeah. I love hearing about them all. I got to add Kirk Ward back into it because he was, like a, he was like one of the boys for us. He fought for time. He fought for rehearsals. He fought for anything we needed. Even down to flights. Yeah. Yeah, he, he made sure we got what we needed, whether it was time, consistency. But he would come by and actually watch our rehearsals. I've never seen a writer do this before. He would come by and watch our process, then go back and write it in the script. So that way, everybody was more prepared instead of waiting for a video. 
which what most productions do. They see the stunt viz, and then there's meetings about the budget. Can we afford this? Can we do this? Kirk said, ah, I'm just going to write it into the script to make sure it's broken down properly. So, yeah, so important. Us. It's so important to have the ability to do that on yes. the spot when you're filming. Um, Albert, I'll throw my last question your way. And this is the greediest question I could ask because we haven't e these these episodes haven't been released yet, but I have watched them, obviously, and that means I want more. Has there been any conversation at all about doing another maybe three part series or any other format about stories that take place in other hotels around the world? Oh, that's an interesting question. You didn't even ask for season two. You were just you're building out the universe. I, I love the anthology format. and yeah, I feel like I more too. franchises don't explore that as much as they should. I wouldn't even know the answer to that, to be honest. Right. We know ballerinas coming out. Right. We know about this project. Um, they haven't approached me about anything. I guess I, they don't like me. No, um, um, I'm sure they have plans, um, but they, I, I guess uh, if I'm thinking in a, a business way, uh, they wait for the show to drop and see how the audience take to it, and then they make their plans uh, go bigger accordingly. Or they hear yeah. the early buzz and they get a head yeah, start on something that that's already good. That too. By the way, I just want to on camera give you credit for the most original questions I've heard in 32 years. 100%. Appreciate you saying that. I love what I do so much, and I am just such an admirer of every single department that has to deliver work on any film or show set. And the opportunity to be able to highlight some behind the scenes work like we're doing here right now is just like one of the most joyful kind of conversations for me. So thank you for being here and for sharing some of your experience with Collider. And I mean it sincerely, the bottom of my heart, huge congratulations on the oh, Continental. Thank you.